Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First and foremost, let's start our webinar with Umul Kitab Al-Fatihah. Oh, the praises to Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, for giving us the opportunity tonight to conduct our webinar. The purpose of the webinar on Islamically and constitutionally are to see whether the Islam can coexist with feminism since feminism advocates for equality. Second, to see whether equality in our federal constitution of Malaysia is in line with the concept of advocated by feminism. I am Nur Alinada binti Baharudin, who will be moderator for today's webinar. First and foremost, I extend the most welcome to all the viewers. Thank you for joining us today. In today's webinar, we are honored to have two special and knowledgeable speakers. But before we start our session today, let us watch the poem recitation entitled Silent Cry of Hippocrates by MRC Mahala Sumaya. When I was a kid, my mama tied my hair and taught me I should never be scared. She taught me I should be fearless because I am a princess. Until I went to Uncle Sam's 385 years old pride. On the back right, she smiled and told me that God is with you as you do. But Mama, I want to be Kamala because that's what I grasp from Malala. And Papa, he said, a woman is the water. She will fit in everything and be anything. But Papa, why the president's name is Harry and not Mary? Oh Lord, I'm tired and blue. And so long with Maya Angelos. Hope my story is not just a folk tale to you. So, um, they tell you where you were young. Girls, go out and have your fun. Then they hunt and the slay ones who actually do it. Criticize the way you fly when you're soaring through the sky. Shoot you when you are down and they decide and say, she looks like she's, she has been through it. That is written in the song entitled name, Nothing New written by a Taylor Swift who is a global superstar yet a victim of sexism. In a stanza one of the poem, it is explained how sexism and discrimination against women is deeply rooted in society as it is nothing new that it is may start and occur in a family institution. As we all know, a family institution is institution that has the power to build or to break a woman. In standard three of the poem, the author expressed her will to further her study in Harvard University as she saw the importance of education of as advocated by Malala Yousafzai as she aspired to be like Kamala Harris, Vice President of United States America. However, the idea was opposed by her mother on the ground that the author is a Cinderella who should devote herself to the kitchen alone. The sentence, the brood is make you Cinderella, is intentionally written with grammatical error to indicate that her mother level education and how women access to education is newly denied. In fact, it is a generational discrimination. By looking at the stanza of four, it portrays the hypocrisy of our society where it shows the belief women can, can be anything, but when women do, they break her wings. For example, the top position we always granted to men, and this man will preach how, how woman empowerment is important. In a last stanza, it demonstrates with a great that the struggle faced by women is not just a trendy topic or subject that people to say so they will sound like a feminist or human rights activist. Since we are serious in advocating women's rights, hence, we bring to you two prominent speakers to talk on feminism, where the first speaker will talk about feminism through the lens of constitutions 
and the second speaker will talk about feminism and Muslim women. Before we start, let me introduce first uh, our first speaker. The first speaker is Professor Dato Dr. Sham Rahayu Abdul Aziz. She continued her study at the International Islamic University Malaysia, IIUM, in civil and Sharia law. She later took a master in a comparative law at the same university and also PhD. She began working at the IIUM as a lecturer and she wrote many writing published in law journals, books, a newspaper and other type of the media. Whereas in 2020, she has written over 500 of articles and presented over 100 paper. Last but not least, Professor Datuk Shamrahayu Abdul Aziz is the penyandang kursi institusi Raja Raja Melayu from University Technology Mara, UITM. Therefore, we deem that she is the suitable speaker for this webinar since the constitution is her expertise. Next, uh, we move to the second speaker, Dr. Mahmudul Hassan. Uh, he is from the Department of English Language and Literature, KIRKHSIIUM. He completed a PhD in Feminism Literature at the University of Portsmouth, UK. He continued to research writing during a postdoctoral research stage at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. He has been writing on feminism literature and gender issue for nearly two decades. Moreover, he also has written dozens of articles on feminism issues. Um, for example, his article titled the Oriental, Orientalization of Gender, which was published in 2005. He has uh, widely cited by scholars around the world. The idea of his general article of gender issue are feminism as Islamic phobia and the feminism quarantine on hijab. Some of um, his book was published, a Feminism for Mother, Critical Essay on Rokia Shakawat Hussein, Second, Displaced and Forgotten Memories of Refugees. And the third is The Tale of Mother that is consists of Volume 1 and 2. Among the presses that have been published his work are the Asiatic Society of the Bangladesh, Brill Georgia Society, Southern Society, and also um, IIUM, and many more. Now, he currently edits Asiatic IIUM Journal of English Language and Literature. Therefore, we consider that Dr. Mahmoudul Hassan is the most credible speaker for tonight's webinar. Um, thank you uh, to Do Prof. Do Datuk Shamrahayu and Dr. Mahmoudul Hassan for joining us today. So without wasting further ado, let's start off our session with uh, Prof. Datuk Shamrahayu. So uh, I, will, I will ask the question uh, regarding the feminism and constitutions. Um, Prof. Dr. May you explain to us uh, on the concept of feminist constitutionalism? Realizing it's important, are we progressing on it? The, the, the floor is yours. Uh, doctor, you are muted. Um, thank you, um, uh, Sister Alia. Um, First of all, thank you to the organizer. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And salam silaturahim to all and everyone. Uh, my co-panel, uh, Dr. Muhammad Mah Mahmudul. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, students and staff of, of, of this, uh, being the organizer of this uh, program tonight. And I am honored, uh, yet I'm humbled to be invited as a speaker today i'm probably not the best person or the not the best person or not, not the best uh, personality to speak on the feminism but i try my best uh, to to share my my readings and my opinion on the subject matter um what i have to i'm i'm asked to talk about uh, the feminism and uh, feminism and constitution so first of all i would i i don't want to define what feminism is but uh when we talk about feminism uh, many people refers to the movement uh for I mean, 
movement that have been started in the West for the purpose of achieving equality among both genders, especially that is uh, men and women. So the key word is equality. Yeah. Um, but we do have feminism also. I, I do believe that in Malaysia, we do have feminism. But we are not, we are not for equality, but I would believe more for equity because men and women are complementing one another. They are not competing one another. I said, these, these are the things that, this is the, my focus or my, my foundation of arguments. Yeah? Uh, men and women are created by God. I and mean, from probably Dr. Mahmoud will talk about more on this because I'm not the experts. But I just to share um, to the audience, uh, my uh, my students and also anyone who's seeing us, who's watching us tonight. But my stand is that uh, men and women are complementing one another. Uh, they are not competing one another. And Islam has also... Uh, provide platform for women um, as one of the creators of God we are given we have been given some fundamental rights and in the eyes of God I'm, I'm just stating my view eh? in the eyes of God men and women are equal in the sense that they are the creation of God but they have different responsibilities. But in terms of their ibadah, they have the special, they have certain uh, role to, they have certain duties, they have certain role to play, they have rights, virtues, and also merits. So the as far as we see, uh, we have seen in the authorities of our Quran that believers, the Quran always mentioned believers, men and women. And um there are a lot of, or there are various verses in the Quran uh, which are upholding the position and the rights of women. Let's say, for instance, uh, women are forbidden, I mean, men are forbidden to inherit women with, against their will. I think this is among the verses of the Quran that I, I do believe that every one of us understand it. And there's also verses in the Quran which says that Allah has created men and women. And uh, men and women... Uh, uh, to uh, having certain kind of relationship. And man has to live with kindness to women. And that is why we say that women also has the rights. So that is my, generally, that is my understanding about the position of women in Islam. And I hope uh, Dr. Mahmoudou will explain this much better and much detail on this. But before I, because I, I have to state my view, because uh, if I were to explain the provision in the constitution, the feminism and constitutionalism, I have to state my, 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 my main, uh, I mean, what I'm holding on. Yeah, what, what is, the, my, is my view? Okay, uh, when we come back to, when we come to Malaysia, we look at what is the, what is the application of the law in Malaysia. We know that the constitution is the highest law of the land. And we talk about women, women also wants to have certain rights that's, um, that is uh, embedded in the constitution. Okay, um, so of course, um, the constitution is, uh, people would say that the constitution, when we say the constitution is uh, the highest law of the land, it's the supreme law of the land, there's no other law is above the constitution. Um, the constitution is not something uh, exists in vacuum. It has its own history. It has its own reasons. Um, certain provision in the constitution, probably many of us are not uh, law students or even law students. If you study uh, constitution, you may not be, you may not find the history of the constitution. You may not be thought of the details of the constitution. But I'm stating this in a very brief, a br very brief uh, statement to say that the constitution does not exist in vacuum. The constitution has its own history. When we talk about Malaysian constitution, definitely the Malaysian constitution has the history in the Malay land, in this Malay land, in this Malaysia, is the, 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 the state that formed Malaysia. So the history tells us that uh, certain culture that we adopt in Malaysia, 
that we adopt certain culture in Malaysia, that culture uh, has some influence in the making of the constitution. Yeah, because the constitution is something which is we breed this from from our land and soil, soil and land. So we have something which uh, which um, alive in our custom. So people say that the Malay custom is more of, I mean, the majority of us are Malay and the majority of the uh, citizens of Malaysia are Malay. And we are said to be um, patrical system, patrical society. So there is probably um, feminism um, as, as it is understood generally in a global movement, that feminism is to avoid patriarchal system. So is that the same thing that we have in the constitution? Is that the same that we have in the constitution? Partly I say yes. I say yes. Why? Because um, initially when we drafted our constitution, let's say Article 8 of the federal constitution, Article 8 talks about equality before the law and equal protection by the law. So when the constitution says that all are equal by the law and will be will be protected by the same law, does it mean that uh, any uh, discrimination of on the grounds of uh, sex or gender uh, will be protected by the constitution? So until 2001, the constitution does not provide for specific uh, provision to protect discrimination against gender. Only then we amended the constitution that we include uh, discrimination against gender uh, is not allowed. Yeah, But until now, the application of the provision, especially Article 8 Clause 1, so Article 8 Clause 2, uh, is still questionable because uh, only the state authority cannot practice only the state authority cannot practice discrimination against gender. But the private companies, that there's, there's a case which uh, says that if a woman, if a woman entered into agreement with the, any particular private company, and that private company has certain rights to add on certain criteria in the contract. So, as far as the constitution is concerned, there are provisions uh, which try to protect women, but not to the level that fully protected. But only because only the states can cannot have discriminatory rules. But other other company, I mean the private companies, can still have certain uh, what we call a uh, certain uh, discrimination. Secondly, uh, what is talking about what we are talking about now is that uh, about the right to citizenship of a, of children, um, of, of children of a Malay uh, of, of a Malaysian woman of a Malaysian woman who married to a, a, a non-Malaysian, and she delivered outside Malaysia, and the child of this woman will not be considered automatically as a citizen of Malaysia unless and until they register the child, the child or children as a Malaysian citizen. However, if a child of a man, a Malaysian man, will marry a foreign, um, foreign woman and they born outside Malaysia and that children will automatically become citizen of Malaysia. So this is a big issue. But uh, as far as citizenship is concerned, when we want to amend the constitution, we must get the consent from the Conference of Rulers. So this, I don't want to go to the details on that. But I want to say that the practical system is still adaptable, is, is still there, found in the constitution. Okay. And another thing that we have in the constitution is about, um, um, I mean, but I don't see that it is a, this is considered as a, something is prejudicial or something discriminatory against women. 
because my foundation or my argument is that human I mean some I mean men and women are given their duties and they have their own rights so now there are two things which i mentioned just now that the constitution still have to have some in, uh, to be improved on, on 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 in for the purpose of making sure that women will have uh, equal protection by the law but uh, there are other things like uh, some patriarchal uh, some patriarchal uh, preference given to men in the constitution like uh, if you want to become a um, um, a ruler must be a man, a Malay, a man, you know. But to me, that is not considered as something that you want to have equality. Yeah. But is this considered as when I say when, um, the ruler or the king must always be a man, I think this is adaptable to the customs of this country. Although the constitution says so, it's not man, to my mind, it's not discriminatory but it's just for the purpose of merit, rights and virtues, which is also connected, which are also connected to our culture. And then this, uh, this should be retained as it is. Yeah, To me, um, these are the two things which, uh, I mean, briefly, uh, briefly, I want to say about the position of uh, feminism in terms of the constitution. I think that is all. Then... Uh, I hope I can listen more to uh, Dr. Mahmoudur on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Prof. Dato, for your answer. Uh, next, uh, we move to uh, Dr. Mahmoudur Hassan. So, Dr. Mahmoudur Hassan will talk about the feminism and Muslim women. So, I do have a question, Dr. Um, is feminism important and has positive impact on Muslim women? If yes, why? Um, uh, maybe you can, uh, if your answer regarding uh, almost they have a positive impact on Muslim women, uh, may you give the reason for your answer? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahman rahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassiri li amri. Wahlul uqlatan min lisan yafqahu qawli. I was listening to our data and I benefited a lot uh, from her insights. Uh, so I will talk about from a slightly different perspective uh, since I'm a student of literature and not of law. So I will talk about uh, in general uh, in, in, from a literary perspective. So I have been researching feminist literature for more than 20 years now. Uh, right from the beginning of my research uh, on gender issues, I have had two questions that I have had to grapple with. Number one is, I am a man and I am discussing uh, feminist issues, women's issues, gender issues. So isn't it an irony? And number two, uh, feminism is generally considered a Western construct. And many Muslims uh, are uh, disinclined to feminism. They believe that there is no relation between feminism and Islam. So uh, my religion and feminism is another issue that I have had to grapple with. The first one is, I am a man and do I need to or can I discuss gender issues? The answer is yes, because feminism is a question of justice. When, the, when injustices happen in society, it is the duty of both men and women to prevent it, to stop it. It's not the duty of only men or only women. For example, when we talk about racism, um, generally the black and brown are subjected to racist harassment, especially in the West. But we have many white people who are anti-racist. So if a white person can be anti-racist, a man can also be a feminist. Number two is my religion. As a Muslim man, uh, can I study feminism? Can I research feminism? Again, the answer is yes. Because from an Islamic perspective, I look at feminism as a gender movement, sorry, as a, a movement to establish gender justice. 
is not only uh, to be biased to women. It's a question of justice. And the core of Islam is justice. Allah sent different prophets in different locations, in different periods. And Allah says in the Quran, why did Allah send them? To establish justice among human beings. So if feminism is a question of justice, then we can all rally around it and we can get involved. Now the question is whether Muslim women are relevant to feminism or what is the relationship between feminism and Muslim women. In this respect, I have complaints against two groups of women. Number one is I have complained I have a complaint against conventional feminists who do not work for Muslim women. If Muslim women are harassed, they remain silent. If Muslim women are oppressed, they remain silent. As if Muslim women are excluded from their project of feminism. As if Muslim women are not women. When they wear hijab, they no longer they cease to be women. Let me give you an example. Uh, in 2009, in Germany, in the city of Dresden, in July, one Muslim woman named Marwa Al-Sharbini. Marwa Al-Sharbini was killed in a courtroom in front of the judge, in front of the lawyers, in, in front of uh, law enforcers. What happened is that Marwa Al-Sharbini was walking in, a, in the park with her son, and her son was maybe two years old at that time. And a racist was harassing her in the park. And then Marwa Al-Sharbini was brave enough to take it to the court. And she uh, uh, filed a lawsuit against that man. And that man was from her neighborhood. And then there was a date when uh, both the parties had to go to the courtroom. And the, the criminal who harassed her in the, in, the, in the park, he went there with a knife. And he killed Marwa Al-Sharbini in the courtroom, in front of the judges, in front of the lawyer, in, in front of the police officers, in front of her son, who was two years old, roughly. And she was killed on the spot. And her husband went to rescue her. The police shot her husband, not the killer. This was reported in the media. And I went to Germany in August 2009 for my postdoctoral fellowship. I did not see any feminist movement to fight for justice for Marwa Al-Sharbini because she was a Muslim woman and she wore hijab. She was in hijab. So this is a big complaint against conventional feminists. When Muslim women suffer, they are harassed in the street, in the street, they are oppressed and persecuted. We see a kind of silence among the feminists. And Marwa al-Sharbini is just one example. There are many, many other examples, especially after 9-11. I was in Britain at that time. Women in London were being harassed because of their Muslim identity, because of their hijab. And many Muslim women stopped wearing hijab in London because of that harassment. But we don't see any feminist movement to fight for Muslim women. It's as if Muslim women are excluded from the project of feminism. So this is a big uh, complaint of myself against conventional feminists. Now, I have another complaint against Muslim women in general. What is that complaint? Muslim women have been at the center of feminist discourses. Muslim women are considered backward. They are considered passive. They are considered victims of Muslim men. And they are considered oppressed by Muslim men and by their religion. Despite everything, 
Muslim women are not coming forward to speak about themselves and about their religion. There are some honorable exceptions, but largely Muslim men have been talking about women's rights in Islam. Yusuf al Qaradabi, Jamal al Badabi, uh, Tariq Ramadan, and this and that, they have been talking about women's rights. And we don't see a big presence of Muslim women in the discourse of feminism. And this has been hijacked by uh, Western feminists or by secular feminists to argue that Muslim women are passive, they are victims. Okay, so this is a big issue. And I believe more Muslim women should be involved in feminism to make their voices heard and to talk about women's rights in Islam. If a man, I am a man, when I talk about women's rights in Islam, I suffer from a legitimacy deficit. I don't have enough legitimacy to talk about women's rights because of my gender. But when a Muslim woman talks about women in Islam and declares clearly that I receive honor and dignity from Islam, from my religion, then it has a stronger legitimacy and it will be well received by uh, pe people out there. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, one of my students, female students, came to me for a reference letter. And she told me that before coming to IIM, she didn't wear hijab, but after coming to the university, she started wearing it. I said, okay, I'm giving you a reference letter, but can you uh, promise me something? What is that? I said, you need to write an article to talk about hijab. You say why you have chosen to wear the hijab. I said, this is a promise, you need to promise. I gave her the reference letter, but I don't think she wrote an article. What I did, I wrote a number of articles on hijab. But who am I to talk about hijab? Because I don't wear hijab. So when a Muslim woman talks about hijab, it has a greater legitimacy. That's why I believe Muslim women should get involved in this discourse and make their voices heard. Now, I understand why people say that uh, Muslim women or Muslims should not uh, be involved in feminism. There are two main reasons why people believe so. Number one, many people believe that uh, feminism is a Western construct. It's a part of colonization of, uh, the, of the Muslim world. The people want to spread Western ideas and values through feminism. That's why Muslims should avoid it. Okay, so this is one school of thought. Another school of thought that is a secular Islamophobic feminist, they believe that Islam itself is gender oppressive. Islam itself oppresses women. How, how can Muslim or Islamic people get involved in a feminism? Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I read a book. The title of the book is the Dictionary of Feminist Theory. It, was written, it is written by a British feminist writer. Her name is Maggie Ham. And the edition I read was published in 1995. And in that book, Maggie Ham discusses 19 types of feminism, including Jewish feminism and Christian feminism. There is no Islamic feminism in the book. So that struck me why there is Jewish feminism and Christian feminism, but not Islamic feminism. So I was looking for an opportunity to ask Maggie Ham the question since I was in Britain at that time. So in 2006, I met Maggie Ham in a conference in Birmingham. The conference was on Virginia Woolf, and I also research on Virginia Woolf. Uh, I have a publication on Virginia Woolf and I have been researching her writing. Now, I met Maggie Ham and I asked her, you included Jewish feminism, you included Christian feminism, can you please include Islamic feminism in the next edition? 
And she told me that she would not work on any further edition because feminism is becoming so wide and manageable. There are so many brands of feminism. That's why she doesn't want to work on this project anymore. So what I want to say is that there is a school of thought, especially in the West, among secular uh, feminists. They do not want to recognize feminism within the framework of Islam because they believe that Islam itself is gender oppressive. So now I belong to the middle ground. I believe that Islam is not gender oppressive and there can be a feminism within the framework of Islam. If we do not recognize it, then Muslim women will start following Western feminism, secular feminism, Islamophobic feminism. And they will receive different kinds, kinds of ideas and they, will, they may be deviated and misguided. That's why I believe there should be a feminism within the framework of Islam and Muslim women will benefit and they will contribute and they will make their voices heard. So inshallah, with other questions, I will elaborate more. But for this question, I want to stop here. Thank you, Doctor, for your great, uh, for your answer and also uh, sharing with us the story about Marwa. So next, uh, we move uh, back to a situation about feminism and constitution uh, to Prof. Dr. Shamrahayu. Uh, so, Doctor, do you think by having a constitution in our country, it can control the movement of feminism? Should it progress uh, the norm in our country that embraces Islam as uh, our official religions. So, Doctor, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I think I've made myself clear earlier uh, where I'm not totally against a movement for the betterment of women. I think uh, I do agree also with Dr. Mahmoudul just now where women has to work for themselves. I mean, work harder for quote-unquote feminism. Let us redefine feminism <laughs> for the purpose of our uh, nation or for the purpose of our people and for the purpose of our law that we are applying it now. Okay. Um, in my opinion, uh, by, having a, by having a constitution, at least we have some... Uh, benchmark we already have some guidelines on, on what how this um how this uh we are, how way of life for malaysian yeah so where we have a constitution uh, the guidelines are provided in the constitution at least let 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 we talk about uh human rights right when we say about right to life right to right to life right to property they are given or protected equally to all men and women. But when <laughs> there's probably some uh, little exception, we have in criminal law, when you are a woman, when you are a woman, you cannot be subject to uh, what we call, uh, you, you, are, you are not subjected to the punishment by way of... Um, um, I, I just lost the words. Uh, rotan, eh? you cannot be, uh, how, how do you say in English? Strokes, yeah? There's no rotan applicable to women, uh, women criminals. So women are given certain protection in that way because the law of Malaysia does not allow women to be uh, fine, to be Punished to be caned, is it? So that, caned? Yes, but uh, caning, uh, yeah, mm. that, that in law sometimes we use uh, strokes. Yeah. So we cannot uh, punish that women uh, with that kind of punishment. So in our, in our conventional courts at the federal level, we don't have that punishment for women. So the constitution that provides that certain uh, guidelines. I think way back in 2013 of Twelve. There was an application by a man, man offender who was found guilty by the court, that he was arguing that the law is discriminatory against men. 
because why women why men only be punishable with that kind of punishment but not women so uh but i'm trying to say is that when we talk about human rights human right must be adaptable to the society it cannot be something which is alien to the society it cannot be something which is alien to the society because uh, human rights or the law will not be effective if it is not applicable by all. So when we have the constitution, the constitution is, uh, is a law, is the highest law that will control any movement which is against what is adaptable to the society. Uh, it's not about feminism, but uh, that is not only about feminism, but uh, about anything else, or especially on the questions of human rights. So I'm I'm not saying that other things like um, how do we conduct our democracy system, how do we how do we apply our, the democracy system, how do we apply our cultural system, yeah. But it's about let's say the the feminism itself also will be controlled by the constitution. Or anything, any rules whatsoever, it will be subject to the constitution. So, um, I would like to respond a little bit uh, of what had been uh, explained by Dr. Mahmoud just now. That I'm, I'm happy and I'm glad and agree with the, with the idea is that um, feminism is also about humanism, meaning to say you have to recognize women as human. When you say human, uh, therefore, certain humans, uh, let's say now we are, let, I'm giving you an analogy. Let's say we talk about a disabled person. I'm not saying that women are disabled. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm making an analogy. If a person is a disabled person, we have to prepare, we have to provide them with certain facilities that to suit them. Now we have women. Women have certain role to play. Let's say women has a pregnancy. Women has certain, you know, sometimes when they are they, they are a single mother, for instance, yeah, they have to uh, look after their breadwinner. They look after their children. Therefore, certain facilities should be given to women, and this is also part of feminism, so that women must be will be able to have their life. Is a, to have their livelihood, you know. It's not only the life, but to have their livelihood. So let's say I, I'm giving you an example. For instance, a mother. I'm a mother also. So for instance, a mother. When you go to work, but your children are not well. Usually, the father says that uh, give them medication or medicine. But who's giving? Mean I'm giving. I'm making a generalization. Yeah. Usually, mothers do. You know, to give medicine to the children. But when the mother goes to work, because of the our conduct of life now on that women goes to work. When we go to work, our minds are not stable because we are thinking about how is the condition of our children. So these facilities must be given to women. So where you do get where do you get that? You get that in the policy of the government. So the government must provide certain policies. How this policy is to be to be made? The policy must have some grounds or source of power from the law. So must have law to allow the government to make such a policy. So the constitution provides that that everyone must have right to livelihood. So I think on that score, the constitution provides background or back, I mean provide um, at least uh, the very basic foundations on giving women their Justice, justice to women, and also protection of their rights. Um, when when we talk about a uh, constitution, um, it's not about controlling. I think uh, if we say that a constitution is only to control, I don't think that is not, that is not a right. Uh, I I think that is not a right perception or it's not a right description about the constitution. The constitution is providing way of life. How do we conduct our life? That is in the constitution. I'm not saying that constitution is like Islam that people always, uh, of course, in IUM people say that Islam is a way of life. Everybody, all Muslims say that Islam is a way of life. Yeah, but as a nation, 
as I mentioned, the constitution provides way of life of how do we conduct our life in the country of a nation. The, if we want to know the nation, we see the constitution. So what is there in the constitution? So um, the constitution is to provide a basic uh, basic foundations or uh, to provide foundations or the basic criteria of a society. Therefore, the, so when the society recognizes the rights of uh, people, that it's not only men but also women. And considering the merits, the responsibilities, and the rights of women may be different from men. So, Certain law, a certain policies has to be drafted for the benefit of women. So, um, okay, let's talk about a little bit. I want to say about, I want to share my opinion about um, sexual harassment, for instance. Yes, I know not not only male, not only female or women are facing sexual harassment. Men also uh, may be a victim of sexual harassment. Therefore, I believe uh, when we talk about sexual harassment, we must also have some seriousness to its uh, protection of women, to protect women. Because uh, the foundation is not well, I mean, explained or it's not expressly explained in the constitution, but there is the contents of the constitution. Okay, but it's the contents of the constitution. Okay, um, although I'm I'm a law student, I'm a constitutional student, uh, students of constitutional law, but I don't really believe that only the law can, uh, you know, can provide security for women. We need the, we need, um, apart from law, we need culture and political will to protect women. Yeah, I mean, I'm not to say that I, I don't want myself to be seen as gender bias when we talk about feminism is to protect women. Yeah, but in other topics, probably to protect uh, human, human, humanity and humanism. Okay. Um, therefore, when, when we talk about uh, protection of women, uh, it must have law that is, that is the must law. And another is we must have uh, the culture must have uh, some contribution in the protection of women and political will, like legislating the law, providing policies, providing the uh, facilities for women. Yes, of course, uh, there's no country in the world that can give you protection to women. But if we compare, uh, but if we look at the constitution of Malaysia, um, we are trying to give uh, protection to women as much as we protect all other persons. All other persons, yeah. Uh, so when we talk about the constitution, I want to conclude my discussion. Um, um, when when we talk about the constitution, the constitution is to provide way of the provide way of how we to conduct how do how do we conduct our life as a nation. Um, and we also to by having that constitution, we we able to uh, to filter whatever coming to Malaysia, whatever. Uh, ideologies that come to Malaysia. Okay, um, Sisa Alia mentioned about the position of Islam as the religion of the country. And probably uh, definition when go to the details, application, let's say application of the hukum, hukum shara to the Muslims or Malay, to, to Muslims or um, women, Muslim women, yeah? application of hukum shara to Muslim women may be different according to Mazahid school of thoughts. Therefore, when we go to the details, let's say right to marry. The Hanafi school and the Shafi'i school has different school of thoughts. So when we talk about Islam, uh, you have different school of thought. Therefore, let's say um, a virgin in Shafi'i 
cannot marry a man of his of her choice without the consent of wali, permission of the wali. But the virgin in Hanafi can marry. I think I think that if if I don't mean I think that is the hukum shara. So although we have Islam as the religion of the federation, but in the application of the hukum shara, they may be different from one people, I mean, one group of people to another group of people. Therefore, what is best for it? What is best that follow what those people follow? I mean, follow the school of thought that those people follow the school of thought. So, sorry, in, in Hanafi, let's say you can, you know, uh, the, the, to force the children to marry, right? So the father have the right to force the children to marry. So somehow you don't need wali in Hanafi, for instance, yeah. So I mean, I, I think there's some. I'm sorry if I'm not very well versed in the hukum shara, but please, doctor, please advise later, yeah. So although we have Islam as the region of the federation, but differences of opinion in Islam must be addressed. Also, must be addressed according to the circumstances that give justice to every person. Right? That give justice to every person. Um, it, it just uh, when when we talk about application of feminism according to Islam, uh, I would say yes, we should respect the religion of Islam when we adopt uh, feminism or any ideas or ideology that being, you know, to be applied here. But I don't uh, I don't think that we should uh, adopt something. I um, mean, the ideology from uh, feminism to say that uh, women has uh, absolute rights of herself. I don't think that would be, I don't think that would be uh, a right to say so. So we go to the hukum shara. But what I'm saying just now is that there's an example where you may find differences in feminism as a right to marry uh, from Islamic perspective. Yeah. Um, so as far as the general understanding about the position of Islam and feminism, uh, yes, I would say that whatever ideology, you must respect the religion of Islam. And probably people will say that this is uh, centric towards Islam, but probably I will uh, discuss that later. Uh, but with, with, the, with, the, with the quotation that Islam is a way of life, and Islam is a religion of peace. And Islam is suitable to all people at all times. So I will I will refer to this later when I answer my future the future questions. Thank you. Back to you, Alia. Thank you, Prof. Datu, uh, for your great answer just now. And next, uh, we move to the uh, second question. Uh, regarding feminism and Muslim women uh, to Dr. Mahmudul Hassan. Um, so, Dr. Uh, may you um, explain to us uh, the concept of equality in feminism and whether um, it is in line with feminism. So, Dr. you may uh, share with us. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, thank you for these questions. Uh, again, I benefited a lot from uh, Prof. Datu's uh, deliberations. That was very useful. Now, I think Datu also touched on this issue that we do not uh, agree with the concept of equality. We rather promote equity. Uh, let me give you an example. I am now sitting in my office and I have a table in front of me and I am sitting on the chair. Now, if the chair and the table are of the same level, then I may not function well. I need the chair, chair a bit lower and the table a, table a bit higher. Only then I can function. But if my chair and my table, they want equality and they want to be on the same level, then that will not be fit for purpose, okay? So that's why the concept of equality has many problems. Now, let me give you another example. Let's say I know two students who have organized uh, this webinar, Alia, Nadia, and I know Hakima. So let's say 
I want Alia to buy a laptop. And I want Hakima to buy a printer. So I send them to lawyers or to Wangsa work, and I give them money to buy me two things. One is a laptop and the other one is a printer. If I give equal amount of money to Alia and to Hakima, that will be injustice because Alia will need to buy a laptop. She needs more money. And Hakima will buy a printer. She does not need equal amount of money. So sometimes equality is unjust. Let's say another example. I need one whole plate of rice to feel satisfied. But my son, who is uh, nearly two years old, he may need one quarter of a plate. But you want to establish equality. You gave both of us half, half a plate. You gave me half a plate and you gave my son another half a plate. So what will happen is that I will not feel satisfied because I need one whole plate. And my son will waste half of his rice because he doesn't need half of the plate. Okay. So this is how the concept of equality doesn't serve the purpose of gender justice. People blame Islam that Islam does not give women equal inheritance. The question of inheritance in Islam is not a question of who is man and who is woman. The question of inheritance is based on the question of justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given man more financial responsibilities in the family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has relieved women from some of the financial responsibilities. That's why in some cases, Allah has given men more because they have greater responsibilities. And in some other cases, Allah has given women more because they have greater responsibilities. Let me give an example. A man came to the Prophet and asked him, who is the most deserving of my good treatment? Our Prophet said, your mother. Then who? Your mother. Then who? Your mother. Then who? Your father. So that means three quarters of good treatment will go to the mother. And one quarter will go to the father. So in this case, father is one quarter and mother is three quarters. So shall we say that Allah uh, did injustice on men? No, we cannot say that because Allah has given a greater respect and rights of mothers in this respect because mother bear greater responsibilities in bringing up, in giving birth first, in carrying the baby in their uh, in their uh, tummy, and then the breastfeeding and rearing, and then all sorts of love and affection that they give. So men have less responsibilities in rearing children, and mothers bear greater responsibility. That's why Allah has given more to women in this respect, and in some cases Allah has given more to men. So that's why the question of feminism in Islam is a question of justice. It's not a question of equality. That's why I believe it's better to avoid the word equality when we talk about feminism. Rather, we should highlight the concept of equity. And some, some people even do not use the word feminism. They just say gender justice. Gender justice. So I will i will want what i deserve and my wife will want what she deserves it's not because of our gender or it's not because i am a husband and she is a wife no it's because what we deserve and what uh, is just on both of us anything that is unjust anything that goes against justice is un-islamic as i said earlier the core message of islam is justice if in a society people pray five times a day, they go to Hajj, they do this and that, but that society is based on injustice. That society will never become Islamic. 
despite all other rituals, despite all other Islamic observances. If justice is absent in a Muslim society, in a Muslim country, that society, that country cannot be Islamic because the core message of Islam is justice. That's why I repeat, I support, as uh, Prof. Datu said, we support the question of equity, not the, uh, we, we support the project or the idea of equity, not equality. As I said earlier, equality has many problems. I look forward to answering to other questions, inshallah. Uh, thank you, Doctor, uh, for your answer regarding feminism and Muslim women. That is re related to the equality. Uh, so next, uh, we are move uh, to our first speaker, uh, Prof. Doctor Shamrahayu. So uh, according to the Article Eight of the Federal Constitution, it is mentioned that all people are equal before the law. However, uh, as we see in our current it seems that women are being discriminated against by the opposite gender because the differences in the physical appearance that make them look weak and incapable to do to do what men do. So uh, based on this uh, current situation, do you think that uh, this is in line with Article 8 of our constitution? So the other, uh, uh, yeah. so, you may ask a question. Yeah, um, it's difficult for me to make a general remark uh, like what Alia did just now, where women in Malaysia are, discrimin um, are discriminated despite of a provision in Article 8. Yes, earlier, in the earlier part of my speech just now, I said there's some still weaknesses and uh, weaknesses and in, um, in the provision of law regarding um, regarding avoiding discrimination against women but to say that uh, women are, are discriminated uh, I mean to the large level I mean it's a huge percentage that women are discriminated uh, discriminated I cannot say so but I do find um, possible ways that women has been discriminated yeah um i during my when, when i do some research on this on, on on the position of women when i'm involved in few uh committees at the national level yeah um, we found out that uh, let's say a uh, women in a higher position. Let's say the government policy is that women have to participate. Uh, women will be given the opportunity to participate in decision making. Uh, Thirty percent of women will be. I mean, the, the government will will provide thirty percent of women to be involved in policy making or decision making. And as far as the government sectors are concerned, yes, women have reached that 30%. But the private sectors, uh, they yet to reach a 30%. It's about 26% uh, uh, women involved in the decision making. So uh, as far as the provision is concerned, it tries very hard to ensure that there's no discrimination against women. And that is why um, the government has made that certain policies that 30% of women to be involved in decision making. But I, as my experience as, as a woman myself being involved uh, in the decision making, I don't think that I am this discriminated. But I do find that's uh, I do find that um, there's still uh, people who think that women uh, should not be involved in certain in certain profession that's uh, that only women, only men that should be involved. Let's say uh, this is from really my experience from uh, religious institution. I have to share my with the audience that I am I am a member of 
uh, Islamic Religious Council for federal territories and also the state of Perak. Of course, uh, in the state of Perak, there are only two members are women. And in the state of, in, in the Wilaya Persekutuan, there are also two women uh, in the Majlis Council. That when people ask, are women well uh, represented in this, the Islamic councils? Yeah. But uh, my, my, my opinion is that it's all based on merit. It, will be, it should be based on merit. If women are capable, let them be. So there should not be any bias towards women in terms of their uh, mental ability or professional ability or their physical ability. Um, I think there are women also, there are women who have some physical disability also have been, have been, have been appointed in the government uh, committees uh, or, or pos, pos, in the, to be in the position of decision-making uh, position. Yeah? So as far as the law is concerned, um, there's no such, uh, there's, there should not be such discrimination. And this is more difficult for the government, especially the government sector, to be discriminatory. But it's much easier for the private sector to be uh, to uh, I mean, to practice discrimination against women. This is indeed, as I, mean, uh, as, as, as I explained earlier, Article Eight, Clause Two says that there should not be any law which is discrimination against women. Uh, the government, the state authority, or the federal authority. But there's no such uh, guidelines for the private sectors. So the constitution still yet to be improved on these uh, private sectors to make sure that they don't apply discrimination or they don't discriminate women. And we have seen also uh, in Malaysia, uh, there are some regulations that force women not to I mean force women not to uh, not to practice their religious uh, requirement like wearing tudung for instance in hotel businesses yeah so they they've been forced not to uh, observe their religious requirements and uh, this also I think this is also part of discrimination which is happening in the private sectors but not in the government sectors so uh, their colleagues and their audience. Uh, much respected that I would say that uh, certain changes has to be made in the private sectors. Uh, as far as the government sectors, we have sufficient law to protect women from being discriminated, uh, from, the, from being uh, regulated by discriminatory, discriminatory regulations. But uh, even in the government agency, there must be also change of paradigm, change of uh, thoughts of how they see women. But my experience tells me, being, being a woman uh, who's involved in uh, various government uh, committees and agencies, I, I don't find discrimination. But some of my colleagues do complain that there's discrimination. But I personally, I, I don't find uh, any discrimination. Probably I I'm not too sensitive on this. Probably I'm not too sensitive, but some people are very sensitive. Some some women are sensitive, but probably I'm not that sensitive. Uh, I would say I, I do believe if I am able to become, I mean, to to profess certain to to be in the position of certain position, I, I should be entitled to. But I just say that if I don't get it, it's not because that I'm not because I don't get it, not because I'm a woman. I don't get it because I don't have the merit for that. This is, I believe in that. But probably you know, there are women out there who disagree with me. Uh, but that is my personal opinion as far as the practice of feminism in Malaysia is concerned. Yeah. So I'm um, coming back to Article 8. Yes, certain improvement is to be made. One, to the provision of law to protect women so that there's no discrimination in the private sector. 
And secondly, whether in the private sector or in the government sector, this is not about law, but this is about culture where women should not be seen as, uh, as a second-class citizen or the, I mean, in the position lower than men. And women should be seen as their, their, of their merit and their professionalism. But one problem that I, want, I found, certain colleagues of mine, they say that they rejected certain offer to the higher post, for instance. Why? Because they themselves do not want to be, get in, to, be, to be in that position. It's not about discrimination, but it's about they themselves who do not want to uh, sit in the position or to be appointed in that position. Yeah. Um, so in my opinion, there are certain things to be improved, but it's not too long way, but it is about how we, how we see or uh, how we apply this in our practice and how do we change our uh, line of thought uh, uh, regarding uh, women and their position in the society. Thank you, Alia. Back to you. Uh, I think Prof. Dato, uh, Dr. Shamra Hayu uh, for giving us um, explanation uh, regarding Article 8 of our federal constitutions. Uh, so uh, I will go to Dr. Mahfudul Hassan uh, for the question uh, about feminism and Muslim women. Uh, Dr. Mahmoudul, if um, Islam is a complete and comprehensive religion, then why do you think feminism is important to a Muslim woman? Uh, can uh, can't the woman just rely on the religion without adopting uh, some ideology from uh, feminism, from that feminism? So, Dr. the first is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh... And to answer this question, let me go back to the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know that during our Prophet's time, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established many of women's rights which were absent in, uh, in their society. So our Prophet established those rights. Now, why did he do that? He did it not because of any feminist movement, not because of any demands from any quarter to establish women's rights. Our prophet did it because he came to this world from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish justice. So the women question, the women question or the rights of women were part of that bigger project of justice. So his program was to establish justice. And then he saw that there are some issues uh, uh, in society involving women and women are being persecuted, they are being deprived. That's why I need to address them. Even though there was no feminist movement to establish gender justice, but our prophet did it because this was part of his larger program of establishing justice in society. Now, that is what Islam stands for. Islam stands for justice. And in society, there are many wrong perceptions about women. One is women are inferior. Other is uh, men are superior. Uh, there are so many. And another is women are responsible for the fall of men from paradise. So many uh, wrong perceptions. Now, how to counter these perceptions? Let's say uh, many people still believe that men are superior and women are inferior. Even though in the Quran, Allah says clearly, the first verse of Surah An-Nisa, Allah says, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim, Ya ayyuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida. That Allah has created human beings, all of us, Allah has created us from one person, from one nafs. Nafs is not person, it says nafs is kind of being, from one being. That means we are all from one entity. 
men and women are both from one single entity. The change that we see is in our body structure, in our needs, in our uh, biological needs. We see change differences, but actually the origin of both men and women is the same. That is ruh, uh, soul. The soul does not have any gender. Soul does not have any gender. Our body has gender identity, but soul does not have any gender. So that is to say, in Islam, there is no question of superiority or inferiority based on gender or based on who is man or who is woman. This is number one. Number two, in the Quran, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adama." I have honored the children of Adam. And the children of Adam are both men and women. That means every man and every woman are honorable. That is what the Quran says. So if human beings are on uh, our uh, Prof. Datu said uh, the question of human being, the question of human, not gen the question of gender. So our dignity is because we are human beings. And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adama." I have honored the children of, human, uh, children of Adam. Another thing is, another aspect is uh, in terms of ajr, in terms of reward. Islam does not differentiate between men and women. Allah says in the Quran, إِنِّي لَا أُذِي وَعَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى I do not frustrate the action of any man or woman. That means if I do charitable work, I receive reward from Allah. If a woman does the same, she also receives the same reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no difference in terms of reward between men and women in Islam. But in the West, there was difference for a very long time. For example, in Britain, for a very long time, women could not own any property until 1882. Uh, we, those who are law students, they may know that in Married Women's Property Act, 1882, that was the first time when women in Britain started to own property. And women did not get equal salary until 1995, I think. So equal pay for equal work was not there in Britain until 1985. And that is not long time ago. So, but in Islam, there is no such difference in terms of reward, in terms of payment. Both men and women receive equal payment, equal reward for equal work. There is no difference in terms of reward, in terms of payment. Now, if all these rights that I have mentioned, the dignity that Islam has given to women, if these rights are, are not established in society, what shall we do? For example, for a very long time um, in Muslim societies, the rights that Allah has given to women have not been highlighted for a very long time. So if this happens, we know that Islam has given women their rights, but if society does not want to establish those rights, what shall we do? We need a movement. We need a movement to regain those rights. And that movement, movement you can call it feminism or you can call it gender, gender justice, but the movement should be there. So whether we call it feminism or gender justice, there must be a movement to establish what Islam has given women. Now, shall we call it feminism or shall we just call it something else? I do not worry too much about the name. We can call it feminism, but if we are opposed to feminism, we need to know that there are so many types of feminism. We are maybe opposed to certain types of feminism, but certain other types of feminism are okay. We may agree with them. And one piece of information that I want to share with the audience is that there are two things here we are discussing now. One is the term feminism. The other one is the concept of women's rights. 
I repeat, there are two things here. One is the term feminism. The other one is the concept of women's rights. Which one came first? The concept of women's rights is much older than the word feminism. The word feminism was first used in, in, the, English, in, the, in the English language in 1887. 1887. If you go to a Miriam Webster dictionary and write feminism or feminist, you will find that the word were for, was first used in 1887. So that means before 1887, the word feminism didn't exist or it is not known to have been used. But the concept of women's rights is much older. In Britain, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a book titled A Vindication of the Rights of Women, and it was published in 1792. So the book was published in 1792, and at that time, the word feminism was not there. But that did not stop people from working for women's rights. So that I, what I want to say is that the term feminism is not important. What is important is the concept of women's rights. And we know that, as uh, Datu Prof mentioned, that there are certain areas where we still need to work to establish women's rights. Now, when we launch such a movement to establish women's rights in certain areas, what shall we do? Whether we use the word feminism or not, we need to work. If we do not want to use the word feminism, that's fine. But I also understand that the term feminism has some cultural associations. As I said earlier, that many people believe it is a Western construct, and many people believe it is a part of colonization. Uh, the Western feminists, they want to spread Western values and ideas through feminism. So, but I also said earlier that there are many types of feminism. We can embrace certain types and we can ignore or disagree with certain other types. But my humble opinion, in my humble opinion, I don't see any harm for Muslim women or Muslim men to get involved in feminism. If we get involved in feminism, we will use it uh, within the framework of Islam. We will not use it outside the framework of Islam. And this is how Muslim society will have the right direction to work for women's rights. But if we turn away, if we avoid the movement completely, that many among us will start embracing Western ideas and they may be deviated from the teachings of Islam. That's why I believe we need to engage in it and we cannot ignore it. If we ignore it, maybe there will be more harm than benefits. Over to you, Alia. Thank you, Mahudur, uh, for explaining to us regarding the feminism and Muslim women question just now. Uh, so now uh, we are moving uh, to our next uh, session, which is a uh, question and answer from the audience. So the first question is from Irsha Ijlal. In Malaysia, despite majority of the women are Muslim, we have women from many religions and cultural backgrounds too. And this includes the aborigines or orang asli. How do we want to ensure that feminism in Malaysia can cater to all women regardless of backgrounds and making it not too Muslim-centric? Or should it be Muslim-centric idea of feminism? So this question, uh, I will pass uh, for speaker. Maybe Prof. Dr. Dr. Mrahayu to answer it or Dr. Mahmoud. Prof. Dr. Uh, uh, you are muted. I, can I share my view on this? Yeah. Um, and then after this, probably Dr. can also add or to give, give his opinion also on the subject matter. Yes. Uh, first of all, mm, Let's come back to what Islam is. You know. When we believe that Islam is the religion of, for all, it's not about Islam is Malay-centric or Muslim-centric. Uh, Islam is for the, the... Islam is justice. 
So that is what we've been talking for the past uh, one and a half hour. The Islam is for the purpose of justice. So in my opinion, we are not, I'm, I'm not saying that we are imposing on Islam, imposing Islam on, on, on those who are not professing the religion of Islam. But I believe Islam introduced a lot of universal values. The universal values uh, will be suitable to all across their belief and also origin. So it doesn't matter if we talk about justice, just what is meant by justice. Justice is uh, briefly defined as uh, putting something at the right time, at the right place. So giving right to the right people. And therefore, it will be justice. Um, I would like to share with you from the legal perspective that say just now Dr. was mentioning, Dr. Mahmoud was, was mentioning about uh, the law of Farah'id and also what is most, uh, what is most uh, interesting in Malaysia is about jointly acquired property. It's about justice. So I don't think that it's not suitable to to people who are not professing Islam. Uh, let's say jointly acquired properties that we, we mean the spouse contributed to the marriage and they bought properties and all. So they should be shared if that's happened, uh, they separate, they are separated or they divorce. And then both parties should be given their rights to the property because they were jointly acquired. Although some probably has not uh, physically, uh, I mean physically or they are not contributing by way of money, but they're contributing to support the family and all that. I don't think this is rejected by people. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, let's say in the constitution also, we don't differentiate between the uh, Muslim women or the people who are not professing the religion of Islam. So uh, to my mind, um, when if, if we see that... Uh, is too Muslim centric. Um, we should say that it should be is of universal value centric. That it will be adaptable to everyone. But being being a Muslim myself, I probably been said that I'm for my religion. You know, I mean, uh, many of us who are professing the religion, of course, they would say that their religion is the best religion, and the, the teaching of the religion would be the best one. But uh, for here, I want to say that I believe in the universal values that Islam introduced, then it is suitable to all people and is suitable at all times. Mm, however, we do have problem in the application of the hukum shara. That's it. Uh, some, some, some are too extreme right and some too extreme left. But we want to find uh, the wasat, I mean, uh, wasatiyah the middle way uh, that is not too light, not too right, not too left, but is suitable to all. Um, as far as the law is concerned, as I said, it does not, um, it does not uh, consider a race or origin or religion as a barrier. Uh, so justice is colorblind, it's for all and everyone. I think uh, that's only my view, uh, Doctor. Probably you can add more and give some insights on this. Uh, I think there is a question to me that is, there is some scholar, there are some scholars who deeply studied feminism said that feminism can, can lead to apostasy. Can you share your view on this? Okay, I have been studying feminism, as I said earlier, for a very long time. And Alhamdulillah, that did not lead me to apostasy. That strengthened <laughs> my beliefs. So it's not true that if we study feminism, that will lead to disbelief or kufr or secularism. I understand why this question is raised, because we see that many people who are involved in feminism they are either agnostic, secular, or anti-Islamic. Uh, that is because they are the majority. But when we get involved in feminism and we make our voices heard, uh, there will be some kind of balance in the feminist movement. Uh, as it stands now, uh, Muslims' participation in the feminist movement is not very dominant. 
is not very visible. That's why we see there are more secular and agnostics or atheists in, in the feminist movement. Uh, and also, uh, my advice to those youngsters who are interested in feminism, uh, I want to give you this advice. Before you start your study on feminism, you try to understand Islam first. You try to read uh, materials, articles, and books by reliable scholars on women in Islam. That will give you some kind of protection. When you uh, encounter uh, un-Islamic or non-Islamic ideas, you will know the answers beforehand. So if you jump into feminist studies without doing homework, without understanding Islam correctly, then there is a danger that you may get deviated, you may get misguided. So my advice, I repeat, is before you study, start studying feminism, you have some sound knowledge of Islam, you read books written by Islamic scholars on the subject, and that will protect you later from any uh, wrong, uh, from any deviation, inshallah. Okay. So, and then another uh, question is on, uh, about equality. I think the person uh, simply agrees with us that, we, as I said earlier, there is problem in equality. What Islam says is adal or justice. So I also agree with the, the person who put these questions. Are there any other questions, Alia? Uh, yes, um, thank you, uh, Prof. Dato and Doctor, for your answer for the previous question. So the next question is um, from Adira Muhammad Salmi. Basically, there is no country in the world that is 100% safe for women with the freedom to live equally. Does the panel agree that Malaysia is better than the other countries when it comes to equal rights, social inclusion or and a sense of security? Or Malaysia has a long way to go. So uh, I open uh, this question to both our speakers. Okay, uh, Prof. Datu first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, uh, um, I, I'm sorry because I don't do uh, comparative studies, but probably uh, Dr. Mahmudu can share his view. But if to answer from the legal perspective here, yeah, what is that in the constitution, then I probably have shared my view earlier where I said that certain improvement has to be made to the law to ensure that the private sectors I mean, I mean, should, be, uh, should, should abide with the, I mean, should, should be given some, um, some new, new way of looking at things to say that there should not be any discrimination. But uh, I to say whether we have a long way to go, uh, it depends on the circumstances. But uh, believe or not, every movement will not have a full stop. It will go on and on. So you will have certain uh, ex a certain point that we think that is is sufficient enough. But we want to be better. If we can go, be, we if we, be, we we will be better. There is no end to the strive for betterment even for women. But as far as the law is concerned, uh, uh, there are a lot of movement now uh, for, for, let's say, amendment to the constitution regarding uh, right to the right to uh, uh, women's right uh, to have their children automatically become uh, citizens of the country. Yeah. Um, probably, I, if I can say something when I teach a uh, subject on human rights, um, master's level at the Faculty of Law, I mean, Kulia of Law, I found uh, my, I, I have various students from various countries in the world. Uh, let's say Afghanistan, uh, Ghana, from some, some African countries. Uh, with due respect uh, to the countries that I came across, I think Malaysia has a better position on certain parts of the world uh, comparable to other parts of the world. This is my general observation. There's no specific studies that I do, but uh, my observation from my students' perspective, like say, 
uh, Afghanistan definitely they they will have some you know uh, difficulties in 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 their culture as well as in their law as far as for the women's are concerned I, I I don't have the details of this but I would if I can recall what I what what I experienced from the discussion. It looks like that Malaysia has better law or better protection for women. Similarly, I have students from from um, uh, Saudi Arabia. I have students from uh, United Kingdom and also students from Russia. And they also say that Malaysia has a better position as compared to other countries. I want to add a little bit on 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 on, on feminism here, where Malaysia also fought against the inequality of uh, wages those days and we have a women's NGO non-governmental organization and also uh, some branches in political party that they they start mean they fought for women's right for equal pay so this we we did have we did have such experience but now the law has been improved then we have such a good way and we a good way of uh, of of protecting women in Malaysia, and another thing I want to say is the the other law apart from the constitution also must be considered. I mean, from the legal perspective, it's not only the constitution that we want to say uh, constitution protects women or not, because the details of the law is found, or the details of the law are found in other law, let's say in criminal law. In, in in family law and and then this is probably an introduction uh, to those who are not um, familiar with the legal position and the constitution is the basic law but the details of the constitution is found in other laws so probably we have future time we have another program in the future time to see uh, what about feminism in other law thank you back to you Mm, okay, so I think it's my turn to say a few words on this, right? Uh, um, I believe uh, in this world, no country will be perfect. In every country, there will be some problems and this and that. But based on my experience, Malaysia is a good example where women are visible in public life. And I have seen many, many strong women in Malaysia. And if some people believe that Islam in uh, Muslim women are oppressed, Muslim women are passive, Muslim women are victims, uh, I invite them to visit Malaysia. If they come to Malaysia, they will see how Muslim women, how active they are and how they are running big, big organizations and they are taking leadership roles in different sectors, both government and private. So... Obviously, there are some issues on which we need to work, as uh, Prof. Datu mentioned. But overall, uh, Malaysia has gone very far in terms of establishing uh, uh, gender justice, especially in education and work. Another country that comes to mind is Iran, where uh, female literacy is much higher than male literacy. I think same, the same is true in Malaysia, like women are much ahead of men in terms of education and intellectual attainments. So Alhamdulillah, Malaysia is a very good example and I believe other Muslim countries can learn from Malaysia. Uh, there are some countries where Muslim women are still uh, uh, lag behind, they are behind men but this is not the case in Malaysia. And in other con Muslim countries, if women lag behind, that is not because of the religion. That is because of cultural practices. So if people say that Islam oppresses women, Islam marginalizes women, then we can give examples of Malaysia and Iran and perhaps Turkey and other countries. But I, we also need to make, make it clear that if in certain Muslim countries women are marginalized, that is not because of the religion, that is because of their cultural practices. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, and Prof. Datuk, for your 
uh, answer regarding the question. Uh, now uh, we have another question from uh, YouTube. Uh, Doctor, feminism has always been a hot issue being debated among Malaysian, as I observe. How do we tell people that feminism is a white subject that has several branches, not solely Western oriented? So, um, Doctor Mamudul or Prof. Dr. Doctor, uh, I open this question for both speakers. Doctor, over to you, Doctor. Okay. <laughs> So I think uh, the best way is to get involved in feminist discourses. Uh, all this while, let's say, since the 1960s and 70s, since second wave feminism, uh, second wave feminism has been uh, uh, feminism of sexual liberation. Women started to talk about their sexual rights, uh, this and that, which uh, even many Western feminists do not agree with. So that's why uh, there is some uh, uh, tendency of uh, West-centric feminism. Uh, but when we get involved and when we spread our version of feminism, our ideas of feminism, then uh, there will be some kind of balance. Uh, other people of other religions, they will also come to know about us and about our ideas. But at the moment, as I said earlier, our participation is minimal. And that's why what other people say are considered mainstream. And what we say is uh, fringe or marginal. So the only way, there is no shortcut way to remove this misunderstanding of feminism. We need to work hard. We need to write. We need to participate in scholarship, in feminist scholarship, so that people get our perspectives and our views. Let me tell you something. I publish uh, in journals, you know, literary journals, in feminist journals. When I talk about Islam and Islamic issues, I can see I have higher or greater audience, more people read about Islam than about others, other issues. Because of Islamophobia, because of 9-11, because of this and that, there is some kind of curiosity among people to know about Islam. But unfortunately, we Muslims are not ready to satisfy that curiosity. Uh, uh, people want to know about Islam. People want to know about Islam and feminism. People want to know about Islam, uh, women in Islam. But we uh, are not up to mark. We have not been able to provide the right material for people to understand. So the, uh, the large and short of this uh, answer is that we, the long and short of this answer is that we need to get involved and we need to produce uh, scholarly material so that our voices are heard. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Prof. Dato, uh, may, did you want to add uh, some weight or not? I think um, Doctor has given a um, splendid answer. Um, but being, being, being a woman, I would say that um, Although earlier part of our discussion, Doctor mentioned you are not the right person to speak about feminism because you are not, uh, you know, not the right, the, the, the directly, directly, the, uh, not a woman. Lah. I mean, that's a short cut, uh, um, short of saying that um, this should be done uh, by women themselves, then will be effective. And um, through my experience, I would say that it's very true that many or not many of us actually understand what feminism is, what feminism is. So uh, how many uh, dimensions that we see the uh, we see the word feminism as an ideology. So basically, I think the Western ideology of earlier feminism comparing to now, the earlier uh, movement of feminism, they went for equality. This is a very basic one. And later they developed, and that's caused probably the changes or dimensions in, in the angles they do, uh, they see in, in feminism. So now, it's probably this opportunity for Muslims to take the situation, I mean, 
to, to take benefit of the situation to explain what is the current feminism mean. So we should reintroduce what have been reintroduced, what have been introduced with the Prophet ﷺ through the revelation, to the divine revelation. And having that divine revelation, a full knowledge about divine revelation, which tells us what feminism in Islam is without referring to the feminism that have been introduced by people who look into the situation where women was considered as property, women was considered as um, capital, or they've been battered and they've been battered and sold, and women were considered as sexual object, uh, and probably they were trafficking in for the purpose of sexual purposes, on there being drugs abuse. So this is the reason why feminism e earlier earlier reasons why feminism arise, the ideology of feminism arise. But when Islam as as a, what the life of the pagan before Islam, for instance, they kill women. So that's the situation where why Islam uphold and giving the special position for the uh, women. So this is also I'm not justifying what happened earlier, but it's just that the experience of the culture, the 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 what have been the practice of other communities earlier, they fought for feminism because of the position of women. We must understand that also, but that is not what Islam introduced. So in in my opinion, when feminism movement was, movement in feminism has changed, and they probably had eight dimensions of feminism, and this is probably uh, Islam can. Uh, can introduce or assist the understanding of the of the people uh, throughout the universe that the, that Islam has introduced a better concept of feminism. But how we do that? How do we do that? How do we introduce to people? How do we make people understand? And therefore, this must be must be through education. So from beginning. From the earlier, as uh, from the kindergarten, we say that is this has has to be introduced. The way that Islam treats women, the way that Islam tells us uh, how do we, uh, uh, what is the communication, uh, what is the what are the responsibilities and duties of of women that has to be respected. What are the what are the government policies has also to be introduced to the people. Since early age is probably, um, I, I would say, the education is the best. Uh, so, uh, in my opinion, how do we make people understand? First, that we ourselves must learn, and we preach it. So, preaching it can be informal and also formal. So, formal must be through education system, informal, in program like this, and we do more. And I would say that there should be more activists from the knowledgeable people. From, I would say that there should be more professors to go and speak to the public because professors should become activists themselves to introduce uh, to the people what is the right quote-unquote ideology in terms of feminism. And it's probably all of us has to speak in the media social. We can use our IG, Instagram, we can use our uh, Facebook, we can use our TikTok, um, become TikTokers and all. And this, uh, our... Professors at the university must take this responsibility, and of course, the students also uh, should be able to, you know, gain more knowledge from the professors at the university and try to work harder and introduce to the people because the media, social in the digi in this digital era, uh, they give us us more opportunity to speak the truth. Although we have a lot of the untruth, yeah, but we it gives us more. Uh, space, more room for us to speak the truth and be that people who are uh, truthful. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Dato. Dr. Shambrahayu. So now, uh, uh, based on the uh, based on this webinar, what can I conclude is actually Islam, uh, Islam we can adopt uh, the uh, like several types of the ideology from uh, feminism, but uh, it, it is in content of the uh, equity, not it is equality because Islam is a just a religion which is, uh, it is placed uh, 
uh, place something at the right place. Uh, and next for the federal constitution, it is actually uh, give us a woman um, protection uh, according to Article 8, but uh, maybe it can be improvised by uh, make a provision to allow protect women more and to to curb this issue, to curb this issue, it is actually uh, not on behalf, not only by the law. It can, uh, it can also by uh, informal and formal education. By mean that uh, the society itself uh, must fix this issue and followed by the law. So uh, that's all uh, from our talks. I would like to thank you uh, uh, for Prof. Dato. Dr. Shamrahayu and also Dr. Mahmudul for joining us on our program uh, tonight. It has actually been lovely to talking to both of you and we are hoping to see you maybe in our next programs. Uh, um, at this time, I will want to thank to our audience for being us uh, until this time. All right, so that's all for today. Uh, let's end our session with Tasbih Kifara and Surah al As. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone and thank you for joining us. See you next time. My skin looks supple and feels